Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I'm your gaming monk. Long ago, I remember reading horror stories of how the latter days of TSR was infamously hostile to people posting custom D&D rules on the internet. I suppose some pokes at Look Wizard of the Coast looked at the same horror stories I saw and said, Hold my beer. Our story begins with Rob Bodine, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, aka Frylock. He's gotten a bit of a reputation for creating one-stop stat blocks, consisting only of relevant crunch to minimize lookup. This went well for a while till he got an email from a Watsy paralegal named Martin Durham, who pulled a similar stunt that we'll see with painted magic cards. Quote, Hi, I'm with Wizards of the Coast legal team. We recently became aware of your project. It looks like you've basically copied the text from our books, added checkboxes and spell descriptions, and then placed your own copyright notice on the bottom. I am curious what is transformative enough to warrant the notice. Also, how does this infringing material fill a hole in Wizards' product offerings? Wizards realizes that the Dungeons & Dragons books are more than just rules or instructions. The text is highly descriptive and as such is inherently copyrightable. Wizards requests that you remove your stat blocks or create your own material under the open game license. End quote. Frylock disputed this, and after uploading the template to his stat blocks so others could make them, he began work on a multi-part series of blogs going into detail on Wizards' non-arguments, in his words. This is intended as a three-part series, but later expanded in scope. Now these are lengthy articles, and I do recommend reading them to make your own conclusions. The first part covers the copyrightability of stat blocks. Now in this he argues that there is no hard and fast ruling on the matter. Instead it's by a case-by-case -case basis. Calling back to the phrase inherently copyrightable, he counters with the examples of mythological creatures that have their name and basis in ancient history, i.e. Thor isn't copyrightable, but Marvel's version of Thor is different enough to warrant copyright of that version, i.e. blonde hair instead of red. In addition, he brings up the fact that formulae are not copyrightable on the grounds of not being unique enough. To quote him, If stat blocks don't go beyond the traditional description of the traits of a mythological creature, or how those traits are expressed properly within the context of 5th edition mechanics, then the game designers have no right, nor should they, to forbid them from being republished by a third party. Drawing that line can be difficult, but even if there is an arbitrary choice being made in a stat block, it still may be safe to republish, as that choice may, must represent a modicum of creativity to warrant protection. A stick figure is creative in nature and thus copyrightable subject matter, but most of them aren't creative enough in practice to warrant a copyright. Some are. End quote. Now the second part is on the copyrightability of spells and spell-like abilities. This one is significantly more case-by-case, case, since there's enough room for interpretation to go both ways. This is also where he implies Wizards of the Coast has been doing copyright misuse. Even this claim is one that has some holes, which he admits, but his basis for the claim is rooted in the notion that the text is, again, inherently copyrightable. Quote, Game designers find themselves rightly in another Catch-22. Players want to face the traditional version of devils, dragons, and frost giants, so game designers can't give players the immersion in culture they desire unless they provide material that's long been in the public domain. Only where the game designer, one, has deviated from fantasy elements, or two, creates an original creature and paints a picture of that creature's nature by a complete selection of spells, can the game designer even have a weak claim of a copyrightable stat block. A minuscule number of, if any, stat blocks meet either criteria, and a careful analysis of Wizard of the Coast stat blocks shows that spell selection for completely different creatures are identical or near identical. This means that the selection isn't about telling a story, but rather about striking a careful mechanical balance between the player's characters and the monsters they face. This in turn means that WotC didn't really have a wide array of choices for spell selection, and therefore assures that the players will inevitably make the same choices. Regardless, in the case of WotC and the one-stop stat blocks, WotC has claimed ownership to many stat blocks and spell descriptions that don't meet any of these criteria. Whether or not they can manage to cherry-pick a few exceptions is irrelevant. It's too late. They've already committed copyright misuse with the vast majority of their work, and so their copyrights shouldn't be enforceable until they've publicly changed their enforcement practices. At the very least, reproducing the stat blocks is a necessarily fair use. End quote. Part 3 delves into, in his words, the ineffectual open gaming license and subsequently the system reference document 5.0, 
since he's focusing on Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition with this series. Now the idea was a means to tell the public of what their output was protected and what was public domain. The noble idea that Frylock feels isn't accomplishing its goal. It's in this section that he goes into the misuse that he mentioned previously, and how this has had a toxic effect where the OGL has to be placed in things that didn't deserve it, the gentleman class that Old Spice made as a gag, for example. Moreover, it ends up having a chilling effect on the industry where other companies feel they have to follow suit, even if they get criticisms for how they do it, like what happened with Genesis. What's worse is that this misuse potentially goes back 15 plus years to the original OGL. In Bodine's opinion, the OGL isn't enforceable, but the fear factor of getting a legal letter from a Hasbro-backed company stifles the industry. Quote, Consider what this would mean to a small-time game designer, who may not be using the SRD5, and who may not be sending out illegitimate cease and desist requests. Game designers clearly feel compelled to include the OGL in their work for fear that Wizard of the Coast may sue them, but if they include the OGL in their work, their own copyrights could easily be held unenforceable until they remove it, even assuming no other bad behavior on their part. That's one hell of a position in which to place game designers, all the result of Wizard of the Coast's stated position. End quote. I want to make clear that all of this is a massive, massive summarization of the articles. Truth be told, I personally am ill-equipped to cover this, since I'm a poor layman when it comes to law in general, and IP law in particular. This is something that really should be covered by a more appropriate expert on YouTube, and I'm sure you can think of a few examples already. But since that hasn't happened yet, it unfortunately falls to someone like me to bring up this storm of a matter, even if the thing is... Now at the time of this recording, Frylock has re-uploaded the stat blocks, which would imply a victory on his part, or just Wizard of the Coast deciding not to actually pursue legal action. Even so, I don't think this should simply be left in a dustbin. So I wanted to do my part to spread the word of this story. Now I've had a soft block on Wizards of the Coast for a while, and I think that'll continue. Not just because I want to highlight games outside that bubble, as I've intended to since I started this channel, but because I'm finding 5th edition's presence more and more toxic by the day. Actual toxicity. Not the toxicity present in the minds of the tribally addled. Stay frosty.